Hello and welcome back to the Dragonfly Daily. I am your host, Mike. I am the product manager for Dragonfly at ORS. And we are back with another lesson in the daily tutorial series. Today's lesson will be on 3D stitching. We will look at data set registration when you have multiple image channels, either from different modalities or even in this case from the same modality. We're gonna have a sample where we've done two different CT scans and they have a little bit of an overlap and then you need to register them. And so you can apply sort of this fusion and 3D stitching to stitch the data sets together to make it easier to interpret and analyze. That is the topic for today. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. And we want to see lots of activity in the comments. So if you like this one, tell us what you like about it. If you don't like it, tell us what you didn't like about it. If you know what you want to see in future lessons, write it in the comments. We can also take questions in the comments. I want to see a lot of activity on YouTube so that we know that people are engaged with these videos and getting a lot of value out of them. Now, let's dive into the content on 3D stitching. We will be using Dragonfly 4.1. And as always, since lesson six, we'll be using the customized experience, the custom Dragonfly customization as described in the lesson six. The content for today on 3D stitching, we will be talking, as I said, about registrations. This involves tools to manually move data, to translate and rotate. We'll, we'll talk about how you can uh, visualize multiple image channels at the same time. So there are some issues you can deal with for multi-image visualization, such as transparency or different colors. We'll also talk about automated registration. We'll talk about deciding which data set stays mobile, and which is fixed for the uh, translation and rotation. And the search space itself can include not only rotation and translation, but also scaling. You also have the ability to sort of reduce the computation of the overlap evaluation. We'll talk about that with this restricted zone for scoring the alignment. And then we will talk about stitching. So this is the 3D stitching tool that is allow us gonna going to allow us to take multiple image channels or multiple volumes and apply a blending. So you can decide which volumes you're going to blend. It doesn't have to be just two volumes. It could be three or four or as many as you want. And they may have overlap where two come together or three or four come together and have overlap. We'll talk about the blending method and the out of bounds value. So that is the agenda. The data we're gonna to use today uh, will be posted on the server. I probably don't need to show this because most of you have already watched uh, earlier videos, but if you went to uh, Google and you searched for ORS Dragonfly and on the ORS Dragonfly landing page, which is here, if you just come over to learn sample data sets, here on the, whoops, I missed, learn, Sample, sample data sets. Oh, we added more information. So this is nice, so you didn't know this. We've updated where you can find other sample data that are not just in our repositories, but other repositories, such as a link to the Digital Rocks portal, a link to MorphoSource, uh, a link to some of the uh, data that Paul makes available from uh, the European Synchrotron Research, so the, the Grenoble Synchrotron, uh, some other open access repositories. Anyway, my point is that the data I'm using today, you will find here uh, later today if you want to download the data and reproduce. And that data, as I mentioned, already comes um, from Los Alamos National Laboratory. So thank you, Matt, and thank you, Michelle, for those data. Now, here I am in Dragonfly. I'm going to start by opening those data. I'm going to go to the import ORS objects uh, file right here. And I have in my downloads, I have a zip file, which you, you'll be able to download. And you'll be able to access this file, which is called peppercorn2volumes.ors object. And here you will have something called middle, something called top, and then you'll have an attribution. So I'm going to leave all of these checked and click OK. Now, um, once the data are loaded, I'm going to double click one of these panels so that I can turn on this attribution and see it clearly. So this uh, data set, these data were imaged and processed by the Los Alamos National Laboratory by members of the E6 group. It was acquired on Skyscan 1272. There is also a readme file attached in the zip file that tells you the provenance of the data and tells you any rights or limitations as expressed by the policy of the Los Alamos National Laboratory uh, data sharing. Okay, now what we see in our workspace I'm actually gonna change my layout, um, maybe just to, for things to be a little different, I'm gonna come over to layout and I'm gonna click this button. So now I have three views on the bottom. So I have a view which is an XY view and then I have uh, one of these is XZ and one is YZ. And I'm looking right now at one data set, the one marked peppercorn top. Now I'm gonna select peppercorn top and I'm gonna hold down control and do a right mouse drag so I can have some brightness. Okay, so I have some peppercorns in uh, probably a Kapton tube, but some sort of uh, low density, low X-ray attenuation tube. If I look at it in 3D and I adjust the brightness and contrast, again, I'm holding down the left control button and I'm dragging the right mouse. Uh, you can change all of that in preferences. Okay, so that is this particular image channel called peppercorn top. Now, if I turn on the visibility of peppercorn middle and I, 
select it, then I can uh, adjust its brightness and contrast. So same left control and right mouse drag. Now, and I can adjust its brightness in the 3D view as well. So what I have right now is another image channel and it has not been aligned. So it's superimposed. It's sitting right on top of the first image channel. Now, if I, uh, well, I'll double click in a minute. For right now, I'm gonna use a middle mouse drag to zoom out because I wanna show you that there are two image channels here. I'm going to keep, I'm going to select the top image channel and I'm going to turn on move. So we haven't seen this yet. This is the displace method on the move panel. If I turn on the displace method in this view, you now see these two widgets. You see this widget and you see this widget. We will address both of them. So peppercorn top is selected. When I click on this widget and drag, I am moving one image with respect to the other. So I'm moving it up. Now it doesn't seem to be aligned up here. I'm just gonna do a vertical flip. So when I come back here and I click in this window, remember it matters what is selected. If top is selected and I drag, I am going to displace the image marked top. If I select middle and I click and drag, I'm gonna displace the image marked middle. Now on the move panel, there is an undo. So I can undo the moves on middle until I've undone all of them. So. You see I have done a translation, and you can also see I have this checkbox enabled that might not be on by default. When that is not on, if I come down here and I start dragging, it does update in the 2D view, but it doesn't update in the 3D view until I release the mouse. I'll click the undo button. Now I'm gonna double click to go full screen. So I have these two image channels, top and middle, and uh, I'm in the move state, so if I grab this, I can move. Now, if we look at this, I'm doing a middle drag to zoom, left and right to pan. If we look at this, you might be able to already see that this feature right here at the bottom of this scan is an overlap of this feature near the top of this scan. If I wanted to drag these, well, it's a little hard to see the alignment because one image is in front of the other. Now, you see that middle, occurs higher in this stack. This is my middle, so it's sort of in the foreground, if you will. Now, if I take top and I drag it so that it's placed higher, then now top is in the foreground. So there is a layering mentality of how the objects are ordered over here. So I could try and position this like this. Now, I have the disadvantage doing uh, left and right drag, middle drag to do my pan and zoom respectively. I do have the disadvantage of not being able to see both images at the same time. This one is in the foreground. So if I, if I select it and I turn up its brightness, it's all I see. I don't see anything behind it until I turn off its visibility. Now what I can do is I can select this image and I could click use alpha LUT. Now what this means, this is a setting for 2D, is this lookup table is right now telling Dragonfly that for this histogram, all of the pixels over here need to be rendered as black and the pixels over here need to be rendered as white. But you also see this ramp. This ramp is an alpha ramp and by default it is ignored. And if I click use alpha LUT, then now, let's zoom out a little bit, see the difference between use alpha LUT. When I enable use alpha LUT, those low intensity pixels that are black, not only are they black, but because they're down over here low, they have low alpha. Now I can adjust the brightness and contrast. And what I have now is I'm now able to see both images at the same time, both the top and the middle. So uh, now it's a little easier to see when I'm getting close to getting a good registration. So that is quite useful. Now you could also change the on-screen colors. So if I wanted to change top um, so that it had, so right now this is a grayscale and this is a grayscale, and you might find a workflow that gives you better visual feedback on when you have good registration. So suppose I take top and I switch it from grayscale to cyan, and I take middle and I switch it from grayscale to yellow, and now, if I select top and I do a displacement, you can see the displacement and you might just get a better cue of when things are lined up. So uh, if you look here, and you know, so you can see when things are fuzzy and misaligned and they sort of become a little more crystal clear uh, if you get a good alignment. 
So that's a way of doing this color scheme matching. Now I'm gonna double click so you can see the full view. So this is just changing the lookup table for the 2D views. So you can see it in this view, in this view, in this view. It's not changing it for the 3D. Right now, and this has always been the case in Dragonfly, although we could change this in the future, but for right now, the coloring in 2D is completely independent of the coloring in 3D. If you wanted to color it in 3D, you could come in and color this uh, you know, cyan in 3D as well. Um, but those are not uh, synchronized for you. So if you wanna do that, you're gonna have to uh, make all those settings manually. And then you can set them back whenever you want. So. We've done a course alignment by looking in this view. We could double click here and see if we need to uh, move the top view. Now, if I'm gonna undo, if I had accidentally selected the middle and I'm like, oh no, I meant to move the top, not the middle, then you know you can hit undo. And you can just undo until you've undone all of the uh, translations to middle. So right now, I've loaded both the middle and the top and I made a lot of fine tweaks and translations on the top and middle is unmodified. I'm gonna select middle again. Now, if you need to introduce a rotation, you can. So um, these data don't really need a rotation, but suppose that there was something askew in the scan, I could drag this target and use that to set a pivot point or a center of rotation. Now, when I drag this, I can tip the selected scan, that's the blue top scan, I can tip it and I can rotate about any center of rotation. And if, if you're looking at this in 3D, you'll see it rotating, oh, we unselected dynamic refresh. So now you can see it uh, uh, updating. Now, let me anticipate your question. We do not currently have in Dragonfly 4.1 the capability of using the move behavior in the 3D window. I think we will add that at some point, but for now, when you are in this move state, it gives you these widgets only for the selected 2D view. So it gives you the translate widget and it gives you the rotate widget. So I'm gonna undo my rotation. Undo, undo, undo. Okay, now I'm gonna come over here. Now in this view, I see a yellow, but I don't see a blue. Now if I go back to track state, you'll see that my crosshairs are down here. They're not in this overlap zone. If I grab the crosshairs and, and it snaps right to the selected image because I have top selected and top only goes down this far. But now over here, I have both selected. So this is, and if I go back to the move state, this is a case where you might want to do rotation if, if required. So we could you know, again, rotate in this view. So I just wanted to point out that it's, you can use the crosshairs to make sure you have a good view to visually assess the registration. All right, now what we can do is we can say that we did this and we think we got pretty close, but we would like a high precision sub voxel registration. We want the computer to do that for us. So we got close and we want the uh, computer to go the last few inches, uh, uh, so to speak. So we have done a manual translation and rotation, and now we can let the computer do the fine work. What we'll do is we will right click on an image channel and we will choose data set registration. Now, we need to tell the computer we're gonna keep one data set fixed and we're going to uh, move another data set. So I'm going to keep the middle fixed, in which case it's going to uh, decide that the top needs to be rotated and translated. Now, during this registration, we can tell it we only want to search translational space because we don't expect there to be any rotation, or we can tell it to search rotation and translation space or rotation, translation, and scale. Um, advanced settings will allow you to break out the scale. So if you needed to have differential magnification change in X, Y, and Z, that's permissible with the advanced settings. So we're not gonna actually use scale, we're just gonna use translation and rotation. Now this data set is 15 microns per pixel, and I would like to get translation on a sub-pixel basis. So let's say uh, 1.5 microns would be a tenth of a pixel, let's just say three microns, and that will be the fine step of the search. The initial search or the coarse search we can say can be a two pixel step, so 30 microns, and then the fine step, uh, so this will be a hierarchical search in translation and rotation space. And we could say maybe two to, up to two degrees of rotation, or two degree step size and 0.2, um, or let's do 0.4 to provide the 3D registration. So when I hit apply, it'll start searching this space. Now, I 
did test this on my desktop. I didn't test it on my laptop, but I think we're going to be fine. Before I hit apply, what's going to happen is it's going to evaluate a scoring function, in this case, a normalized mutual information, but you could switch to uh, sum of squared differences. You can choose an option to evaluate that scoring function over a small area instead of over uh, the entire uh, correlative space. So if I wanted to, I could create a box. I'm going to zoom out, turn on the visibility of the box. Um, whenever you create a box, by the way, it takes the shape of whatever was selected. So since top was selected, it just gave me a box that's congruent with top. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drag this down into the overlap zone and middle to zoom, middle to zoom, left and right to pan. I'm going to drag this this way, pan this way, and now double click. And I want to uh, adjust this last axis. What I am doing is I am setting a zone over which it will evaluate that scoring function. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and tell it to use a, a fixed mask from box three. Now I'm going to go ahead. I think everything is set up and I think this will take less than a minute or two. Let's go ahead and hit apply and see what happens. So it's going to evaluate the, the overlap and try and reposition the middle data set. So it lines up with the top data set. Now I'm going to zoom in. Um, hard to see if it, it made much difference. Here it's telling me it translated, uh, basically it didn't do any scaling. It did a, a tiny fraction of a rotation and it did a 30 micron displacement. So about two pixels worth. Now, if I take the top image and I adjust the opacity, we can see what it looks like. Now, there's probably a scaling difference between these two images, so it's always gonna look like there's a little bit of overlap. And now maybe I could repeat it with scale, or maybe we're just on the edges of the CT scan, we're not gonna get much better. Now, what we would like to do is now that we have registered these data, I can click close, now that we have registered these data, we would like to fuse them into one 3D data set. So you note that whenever I have this, this one is yellow and this one is blue, and whenever I adjust the brightness and contrast, it adjusts one, but not the other. The point of the 3D stitching is to stitch these into one data set so then you can do all of your analyses on one data set. So that's the whole point of today's lesson. Now what I can do is I can right click on either one of these images and I can choose stitch 3D data sets. This will immediately create a new box and it will create the stitch 3D data sets dialog. Now stitch 3D data sets, we get to decide what the spatial extent of the stitch is. Now what I mean by that is we can take this box and we can say, I want to stitch but maybe I only want you know, what's here in the tube. So if I wanted to stitch the whole thing, I could make it look like that and I could adjust it uh, in X and Y. So you know, it only gets what's in that tube. Now, and that way we save space. We don't end up making an entire 3D data set with a bunch of air that we don't care about. Now, this has the flexibility of a box. So I could grab the vertex and rotate it. It could be an angled box. So you can choose exactly where you wanna create the stitch. Now, I wanna draw your attention. If I had the box looking like this for some reason, then when Dragonfly creates a new 3D data set, all of the pixels right here, it only has one signal. It has the signal from top. So it knows to populate the stitched data with pixels from top. Down here, it only has one data set. So it needs to populate those with pixels, pixel values or grayscale values from bottom. Here is an overlap region, and it will need to evaluate some sort of blending function. We'll talk about that in a minute. Here is an out-of-bounds uh, zone. So here, you have to tell it what value to put in that. So if you have an out-of-bounds zone, what value does it put? You could make it 255 or 10,000 or zero or whatever. So that's what this value is for. Now, because I right-clicked on middle and chose data set registrations, instead of clicking on both and right clicking. I only have one data set, but if I want, I can add top. And now when I do the stitch, it will stitch both of them. Now I want this to go very quickly. And so I'm not gonna try and stitch the whole thing. I'm actually just going to stitch from a little bit uh, above the overlap to a little bit below the overlap. Um, that'll be fine. Let me look and see how it looks in the other view. Sure, that's fine. Now. Over here in the panel, let me tell you what the parameters are. So out of bounds value I already defined. I'm going to leave that set at zero. Blending. So you can, if you have uh, four different, five different options here. So max means that when there is an overlap, it will take 
the maximum intensity between the two scans. So maybe one scan fades to zero as it gets near the edge. So you'd like where there's overlap to take the maximum contributing intensity value. So it'll search all of these and it'll take max. You could choose mean, in which case <clears throat> it will take the mean intensity of the overlapping voxel from all contributing overlapping data sets. If you choose min, it's the opposite of max. It'll take the minimum contributing intensity. If you choose no blending, then here it'll take the values from top, here it'll take the values from bottom, and in this overlap zone, it will look at this and it will say, well, middle is higher in the list, so it has higher priority. So if middle and top overlap, it'll take the value from middle. So you can imagine you could have three or four or seven scans in here, all in some list order where you could prioritize based on which scan you think gives a, a higher quality or a higher fidelity signal. Now, the last, <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, the last option here is weighted. Now what weighted will do is it will, for like a pixel right here, it will evaluate the distance of this position from the center of the top scan and from the center of the bottom scan. And it's contribution, its coefficient, its weighting factor will be weighted by how close it is to the center of that scan. So if it's near the edge, of a scan, it will have a lower weight than if it's near the center of a scan. That's my preferred solution for uh, blending, so we'll use the weighted. Interpolation, this goes back to a question we had at the top of the, uh, at the, top of the podcast or top of the broadcast here. Um, you can choose nearest uh, linear or, or tricubic. I'm pretty sure this is trilinear, but I would need to check with my team. I'm gonna choose tricubic. And then resolution, so you could specify a voxel size, so I want to specify at 15 microns, or you could specify that this overlapped zone should be 815 voxels wide, 815 voxels by 545 tall. So you can specify either uh, pixel size or uh, matrix dimensions, or if you've got multiple scans, it will look at the highest resolution of all of the scans and then use that, and that gives you the most precise. Now I'm going to go ahead and click Stitch and wait for it to fuse the two data sets into a new channel. Now uh, it's already done. We're going to close this and we're going to look at the answer. So I'm going to, I will, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on the clip box for top and then I'm going to hide top and I'm going to turn on the clip box for bottom and I've hidden bottom. The reason, and I'm going to hide box and now I'm going to turn on my data set. The reason I wanted to show these boxes are so you could see where the edges of the contributing images are. So we might expect there to be a seam in the image here if it did not do a good blend or a seam here. And then oh, this is all overlap region. So it might be blurry or there might be problems. Now this is the overlapped image. I'm gonna turn off these clip boxes now. And so we're looking at the image. I don't think you're gonna see a seam because I think the blending function does a very good job. So this is my blended stitched image. I can look at it in here and I can scroll through or I can look at it from the side uh, and you see uh, both data sets. And so you see a pretty, uh, pretty good continuity. Now something I forgot to describe was it, when we start, so let's double click and turn on the top and the middle and turn off everything else. When we start, we might pass a ruler through the data and if I take a ruler and I look at profile intensity, what we can see here let's, is I'm looking at the, as the ruler intersects three different scans, top, middle, and my blended. Let's turn off the blended. What we see here is that the top intensity in magenta, where it overlaps, is pretty close to the same magnitude of the intensity of the green image. It is not as though all of the uh, magenta pixels are 10% brighter or 20% darker. So these have roughly the same intensity. So we should expect a blending to go really well. If your data sets have different brightness for some reason, so one is brighter or, uh, than the other, then you might need to normalize the data beforehand. So I've looked at a ruler, you can see these have a pretty uniform brightness across the scan, and you can also uh, see the result of the uh, fused or blended overlapping scan. So in the event that you need to, reg need to normalize the intensity of one versus another, um, we could maybe have a, a longer lesson on that, but basically what you can do is you can right click on an image and you can choose normalize histogram and then say I wish to normalize 
my middle, that's what I selected, normalize my middle against my top and click OK. Now that, that's a compute intensive. It has to evaluate both histograms and then compute a, a normalization function. But you can try that out if you're getting uh, bad blends or you're getting a seam. So I think that is everything I wanted to show. Uh, you can use the move tools in any correlative workflow and use the registration tools in any correlative workflow. And if you want to blend and merge or fuse or stitch, whatever word you choose, you now have the capability of doing 3D stitching. Extraordinarily flexible because we give you that customizable box to decide exactly what zone you want to fuse. So you don't create something bigger than necessary or smaller than necessary. And you can even make it a rotational, uh, a rotationally oriented box. It doesn't have to be parallel to your data sets. But do recall in mind, there are issues with resampling. So if you have very fine features, whenever you do blending, you are going to introduce an interpolation. So you could have those resampling interpolation issues. So that is it for today. Let's move on to questions and answers. Thank you for your attention so far. Are. Let me pull up the Q&A. Oh, you guys have tons of questions. So let me see if I can take these in order. Uh, all right. Let me look at that question later. This question, is the grayscale automatically calibrated between the two independent scans in the final merged scan? So I think I addressed it a little bit in the end. It is not automatically calibrated. It assumes that the data sets already have a common uh, brightness and contrast or a constant histogram. If you need to perform that, um, you could uh, do it beforehand. Maybe we should add that as a button on the stitch data sets, apply normalization. Uh, that would be convenient to have there. So um, someone should take a note on that. Um, next question is, would it be useful to crop cone beam artifacts prior to 3D stitching? Yeah, so that's a good, uh, good point. If you're doing cone beam CT reconstruction, you can have cone angle artifacts at the top and the bottom of the scan. Um, it depends on how much overlap you have to work with. If you don't have much overlap, I would not crop it out, and I would just uh, trust the blend function to resolve that for you. Uh, next question, uh, in later editions of Dragonfly, will the YouTube lessons be linked from the help menu in addition to the movies already in the help menu? Hey, uh, someone should be writing these things down. Link YouTube videos in help menu. Thank you, pal. Good, great idea. Uh, next question, can you add a third data set after you stitch two or should you do all three together? Uh, you... Uh, you decide. You can do uh, A plus B and merge it to C. And then, well, let's say you have three images, A, C, A, B, C, and T. Ah, let's say you have three images, A, B, and C. You could take A and B and stitch them into Z and then stitch Z with C if you wanted to. Or you could do A, B, and C together. I'm not sure why you wouldn't do, uh, do them all beforehand, but uh, uh, that's an option. Um, okay. Uh, oh, gosh. Uh, lots and lots of questions. Next question. Please do a tutorial on normalization. So, um, so do me a favor, Sarah. Visit what's next at theobjects.com. Click webinar uh, topics at the top. Input your request and everyone else visit that page and upvote Sarah's request. I want to crowdsource or democratize the selection of tutorial topics so I don't uh, pick and choose favorites. And I just want people to tell me what they want and vote. But we will make a note on there is interest on a normalization tutorial. All right. Uh, next question. Is it possible to mark three points in our data set? Define a plane whose three points uh, within those three points and resample according to the plane, thus creating a new data set to work on. Uh, possible to mark three points in a data set, define a plane. You can do that. My colleague wrote a extension for that and put it in the infinite toolbox to fit a plane to three data sets. Um, yeah, you could resample. So basically you can just rotate an image and choose uh, um, two, two, two. So this gets into resampling. We didn't cover this in yesterday's lesson. It would have been the, the closest. But if I have some weird angle that I've selected and now I want to resample my data along this axis, so this becomes the Z axis of my data set. So if I were to export this, this would be Z slice 564 of 991. I can do that. You just come over here and you choose the image channel. You right click and you choose, uh, my menus are all in the way, right click. Oh, Dragonfly is, oh, it's auto-saving or something. It's, it's not responding right now. You can right-click and choose um, align with current view, but you can also choose resample current data set. 
Uh, ooh, <laughs> I'm glad it gave me a warning. I accidentally clicked the wrong option. Uh, no, I don't want to continue. What I wanted to do was uh, derive new from current view. That'll create a new image. It'll be 991 slices deep and it'll go along this axis. So I'm not sure why you want to do that for your workflow, but you can do that uh, with that option. Um, next question. Do you have a workflow for an image stack for two totally unaligned scans? Uh, for example, uh, the specimen was too large. So they were scanned separately, but can be put together. Um, would you do any of those steps differently? So uh, you you would need some sort of visual cue how to put them together, but it would be just like this. So in this case, it was simple because we only had to translate one sample with respect to the other along sort of the Z axis. In your case, they may be in completely different orientations, but as long as you can recognize where to put them, then you can just drag and rotate to get them in the right position and then do the registration for fine alignment. Um, next question, why are these not showing up in order? Next question is, can you apply the same transformation to multiple data sets? Yes. <laughs> Great question. Um, so I've done all this stuff on top and I've uh, moved it and translated it and rotated it. You can right click on bottom actually. So if you wanted to take all of the transformations you applied to top and now apply them to say middle, you could right click on middle and I think this is going to be down here. Let's see, data set registration stitch. Um, align. Um, so there is align. And what happens if I click align here? Uh, align. Mm, I can't find it right now. There is an align option that is copy. Uh, it's called apply transformation from. Oh, modify and transform. Yes, apply transformation from. So if I right click on middle and I go to modify and transform, I can say apply transformation from. It'll say which object has the transformations that you want to copy or replicate and you just choose it from the list and hit OK. And it just, boom, it just rotates and translates, put it in the same place. So you can do that if you've got three different, uh, if you've got like a low energy scan and a high energy scan and you align the high energy scan and now you want to uh, propagate that transformation to low energy scan, you can do it. Uh, next question. When I am, what if I'm stitching two data sets that have different intensities? Should I try to alter the grayscale values beforehand? So yes, I suggest you do that. You can do that with the normalize or you could apply some sort of offset. It depends on your data. Uh, next question. Mike, I've already shared the serial section images. I can't get everything. Do you have some problem about it? Um, uh, David, I have, I've downloaded the data. I have not looked at them. If they, if I can use them, then I'll use them in tomorrow's lesson. So thank you for sharing those. Um, Aya asks, can you change the order of the items in data properties and settings list, swapping the middle and top, top images order? Yeah. So, uh, yep. Yeah, we just answered that question. Um, and uh, another question, can you increment move, increment translations or rotations? No, you cannot. I have thought about that. I've thought about maybe having an in the properties panel sort of a nudge button where you can nudge in integral pixel steps or some fixed step. Um, we, we have not added it. We need to figure out an elegant and easy and intuitive user interface for that solution, but that will be useful in some cases, particularly if you're trying to avoid interpolation artifacts. Next question, it would be useful to have the rotation triggered by the mouse wheel in addition to the left click. That way you could fine tune the rotation movements. Yeah, there is a problem here in the rotation. It's hard to introduce a fixed rotation. And so using the mouse wheel, as you suggest, might be a good solution. We could also set it so that when you're in the move mode, maybe you, instead of dragging here, maybe you have an option where you can right click and say uh, uh, input a value and you say plus 2.5 degrees. Um, we definitely need something so that you can in introduce those because there's no way of doing that right now. Uh, but thank you for uh, that comment. Next is our data sets collected at different motor positions synchronized. Data sets collected at different motors positions synchronized. Mm, I'm afraid I don't understand the question. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe ask it again uh, with some more details. Next question, how well does the registration work with multiple data sets? For example, uh, X-ray microscopy and focused ion beam. So uh, the alignment works well. You'd want to use the normalized mutual information instead of the, instead of the uh, sum of squared differences alignment, uh, alignment metric. Uh, next question. Um, if you make an oblique box, do you lose pixel data as discussed yesterday? So uh, the answer is yes, but I, I wouldn't use the term lose pixel data. Your, your uh, 
requiring an interpolation. And so the interpolation is going to, mm, I, I don't want to use the word lose, you're resampling. And so, yeah, you're losing some of the original um, uh, measurements. They have to be resampled, but that's just a, a that's just the consequence of doing digital imaging. Next, are there any requirements for both data sets used for stitching? So for example, for instance, both should be reconstructed with the same parameters, um, like center shift and beam hardening. Yes, I would highly encourage you to use the same reconstruction parameters so you get constant grayscale and uh, constant image quality. Um, but that would be just a, a good recommended practice. You could still try it even if that weren't the case. Okay, we're down to the bottom of the questions. This question is, sometimes a micro CT multi-scan reconstruction software isn't enough to stitch the multiple scans while keeping a satisfactory histogram for the whole stitched data set. Would it be possible to use the blend when stitching on both data sets instead of taking a, a connecting region, uh, like uh, take the entire two data sets in order to get a result data set in which the histogram is satisfactory for both? Uh, no, that's not gonna work. Um, that's an interesting problem. I don't know the right approach to solve it. Uh, uh, I, would, I would knock on the door of the micro CT vendor and, and tell them you're having an issue and you want them to solve it since it's coming out of their reconstruction algorithm. But I don't have a, um, without seeing the data more closely, I'm, I'm not sure I can give good uh, guidance on, on a solution for that. Um, two more questions. Uh, next, after registration and stitching in Dragonfly, can you export the stitched images as a single stack of images as a TIFF stack? Uh, great question, Aki. Yes, absolutely. You can always right click on any image channel, whether it's one you opened or one you created, in this case by stitching, and you can go to export and choose images. Here in images, you will have the option of exporting either as raw, as TIFF, or as something called analyze. So if you do TIFF, you can export either as a single TIFF, if this is clicked, or a TIFF stack. So if uh, it would export as many TIFFs. In this case, it is 281 slices, so it would be 281 TIFFs. Final question, when I'm in the 3D view, is there a way to rotate the view along just one axis? That is, turn the image just along the X axis. I can do it uh, really easily in a Viso, and it's really helpful for my type of data, but I'm not gonna figure out how to do it in Dragonfly. So when you're in the 3D view and you want to rotate the view along one axis, um, I think, the answer is yes. Uh, I can think of two ways to do it. So in preferences, if I go to configurable actions and I search for maybe the word rotate, um, <clears throat> what I am looking for is something that will do a vertically or horizontally constrained rotation. Uh, rotate, 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 rotate view around central. Okay, this is not what I'm looking for. So I'm gonna search for the word constrain and uh, if I can type it correctly, and I want to constrain my 3D track mode, uh, constrain track to yaw, constrain, uh, yeah, so like D key. Um, so I'm looking at the D and the R and the Q, and uh, the reason I'm doing that is if I hold down D and I, let's go here, make sure I'm in track mode, uh, if I hold down D, you see how it's rotating on just this one axis? If I hold down R, oh, R is set to ruler. Uh, let's try Q. Okay, now, now I'm holding down Q and it's rotating about this axis. If I release and I rotate, it's rotating about both. So this is Q and this is D and that's configurable in preferences. The other thing you could do, not quite as useful, is if you were in the Movie Maker, you could uh, take your currently selected scene and say, I wish to introduce a rotation and you could choose the axis and the increment. So if you wanted to rotate by 45 degrees in this view, you could click OK and that's what this is. And so this is on that dimension of rotation and here is the plus 45 and here's the zero. Um, not as elegant, but it does give you a high precision for getting that. I'm gonna close Movie Maker and uh, that's it. We answered all the questions. So thanks again for coming. Tell everyone that the deep learning lessons are coming. That they want to sign up and watch them live or they can catch them on YouTube. Those lessons are starting Monday. You're going to learn about deep learning in general for scientific imaging. And then you're going to learn about solutions in Dragonfly, including semantic segmentation, denoising, super resolution, and more. It'll be really terrific material. If you've enjoyed this movie, uh, be sure to hit the like button and put comments down in YouTube below. We're going to read the comments. We want to answer your questions. We want to know what you like about these, what you dislike about these, what you want to see in future tutorial lessons. So as always, thank you for coming. Everyone stay healthy. Be good and we'll see you tomorrow.